hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Gaman Singh. Topping our newscast, the Senate Committee of the Whole began its two-day session on Tuesday. They have a long list of budget bills and non-budget legislation on their plate for those two days. On Tuesday, they started with approving eight nominations to serve on various boards. News 2's April night has details. Sandy, the Virgin Islands lottery has a new director. Juan Figueroa did get a bit of teasing from lawmakers on Tuesday, but ultimately got their nods of approval along with other nominees for that day. Figueroa is a retired major from the U.S. Army. He's also a former board member of the Virgin Islands Mental Health Planning Advisory Council and member of the Virgin Islands State Planning Grant Project. He bantered with senators after his nomination was approved. Remember, if you don't play, you can't win. <laughs> and left the community a message. At least 70 percent of the, the revenues that are generated uh, from the lottery goes back to the community. So uh, we have to be proud of our VI lottery because it is the oldest continuous uh, lottery in the nation. Uh, once again, I ask that the community continue to support the VI lottery and leave other people thing alone. Other approved nominations included Laurel Sewer for the Port Authority Board, Jerry Smith for the Physical Therapy Board, Drs. Laura Bailey and Bethany Bradford for the Veterinary Medicine Board, Jose Penn for the EDA, and Pierina Feldman for the Public Employees Relations Board. Vera Falou was also approved as one of the much-needed board members for St. Croix's Health and Hospitals Board. All of the nominations will be forwarded to Government House for signature. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. Senate President James did express concern about the Public Employees Relations Board chairperson not being chosen by the government employees themselves. Senators also overrode some vetoes by Governor Kenneth Mapp, including an anti-harassment bill. They failed, however, to override the governor's line-item veto that would have made sure that his cabinet nominees who were paid no more than their predecessors. News 2's April Knight has more. For opponents of the pay raises for Governor Mapp's cabinet, the battle is officially lost. The motion for override has failed. During Tuesday's Committee of the Whole session, a motion to override the governor's veto of a line item in a bill that would revert cabinet salaries back to levels failed. Senators who are against the pay raises for the cabinet members did not quite get the 10 needed votes, but it was pretty close. Eight senators voted to override the governor's veto and revert the salaries back to 2014 levels. Seven senators voted to keep the raises. Lawmakers who voted for the override were Senators Jean Ford, Justin Harrigan, Myron Jackson, Neville James, Tregenza Roach, Samuel Sanis, Kurt Vialet, and Jeanette Millen Young. Senators who voted to accept the pay raises were Senators Marvin Blyden, Navelle Francis, Kenneth Gittins, Clifford Graham, Rocky Liber, Terrence Nelson, and Nellie O'Reilly. Senator Tregenza Roach saw it coming and was the only senator who voted against confirming all 11 nominations, saying if the governor vetoed the relevant line item, there's no guarantee they'd get enough votes to override it, which is exactly what happened on Tuesday. Senate President James, however, said it's time to move on. And even if I was not on the prevailing site, um, we move forward and we try to do things as a body that will have, uh, the, the, the public will have um, a collective confidence in us as an institution. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. The Virgin Islands Department of Education encourages all schools, teachers, parents of students in schools, participants in adult and vocational education programs, department employees, and the general public with knowledge of the misuse of federal education program dollars to report it by calling the fraud Hotline there, the following numbers, U.S. Department of Education, Office of Inspector General at 1-800-MISUSED, or the U.S. Department of Interior, Office of Inspector General at 1-800-424-5801. The Virgin Islands Department of Education is committed to empowering all of our students for success. They say all hands should be on deck. The U.S. Department of Justice awards grants to the VI. 
the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services announced funding awards, including a $1.8 million award to the Virgin Islands Police Department for 15 additional law enforcement positions. Over $107 million will be awarded nationally through the COPS hiring program. Officials say these grants are not simply about putting more officers on the street. They are about expanding the capacity of law enforcement agencies to engage in community policing. CH P provides grants to state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies to hire or rehire community policing officers. The COPS office is a federal agency responsible for advancing community policing nationwide. Here's some crime reports on Friday, September 18th. At 1.14 a.m., police officers were notified of a kidnapping for robbery and incident of rape. According to the male victim, at roughly midnight, he and his girlfriend were leaving Mutual Homes Housing when two black men accosted them with knives, demanded money, took them towards a Brown Ford expedition, and began to physically assault the couple. The suspects then took the couple towards Northside in Frederickstead, and tried to rape the female, according to reports. At some point during the incident, the male victim got away, but the suspects drove off with the female. The male victim then phoned 911. Police got a tip that the female victim was in the estate St. John area. She was located and transported to the Wee Louis Hospital. Call 911 if you have any information. Also, Gary E. Garten, 55, of Sapphire, the operator of a Nissan Frontier was arrested and charged with driving under the influence. Bail was set at $500 after injuring three in a vehicular accident on Sunday, September 20th at 1246 a.m. Three female pedestrians were crossing the street southward from Duffy's Love Shack located in Red Hook. A vehicle was traveling eastward, stopped just before the speed bump to allow the women to cross. After they crossed and were in the westbound lane, a Nissan Frontier overtook that vehicle, striking the trio. The victim, who were rushed to the hospital, received injuries, including a concussion to the head, a broken front tooth, abrasions, and two of them received back injuries. At roughly 2.20 a.m. on Sunday, September 20th, Desart Christopher, 29 years of age, was arrested and charged with driving under the influence after being involved in an auto collision that occurred on Nicholas Friday Drive. Bail for Dysert Christopher was set at $500 by order of the court and unable to post bail. According to reports, he was remanded to the Bureau of Corrections pending his advice of rights hearing. The Sierra Lee King Airport was filled with families full of joy, balloons, music, hugs and kisses for the arrival of those St. Thomas St. John rescue paramedics, EMTs, USAR teams and construction crew who arrived on Saturday, September 19th and a celebration took place right after. They arrived from Dominica after serving one whole week with Dominican search rescue recovery team stationed throughout the storm-torn island. Their mission was to help establish joint commands, assist Dominica's fire and rescue, along with a team of engineering crews, rebuilding roads and structures throughout the storm-torn island. Meanwhile, several St. Croix residents came together and accomplished a heroic rescue of a man who was pinned under his overturned vehicle, some four motorists and the injured man's girlfriend, along with some EMTs, helped in the rescue attempt, including lifting the vehicle and performing first aid until the EMTs arrived. And then when they came, they took over. Kudos to these good Samaritans. Monday night's Kappa's meeting was held in Anna's retreat at Faith Christian Fellowship Alive in Christ Church. Members asked questions such as, how can non-housing residents be stopped from dumping their trash into housing authority garbage bins? How can cameras be utilized? And much, much more. A Kappa member attended a follow-up meeting in Red Hook concerning the accident that took place over the weekend. And the solution uh, they came up with was to put a traffic light near Duffy's Love Shack entrance. Now the next Kappa meeting will be held on Monday, September 28th. Come with your ideas and concerns. It will be held at the Faith Christian Fellowship Alive in Christ Church at 6 p.m. We'll turn our attention overseas. Pope Francis wrapped up his historic visit to Cuba with a final mass. His next stop is Washington, D.C., the first of three cities he'll visit. Chris, Chris Welsh rather has a story from Washington. Pope Francis's first official trip to the U.S. has begun. 
President Obama and the First Family, along with Vice President Biden and Dr. Jill Biden, were on hand to greet Pope Francis the moment he set foot on U.S. soil. The Pope will have an official meeting with President Obama at the White House tomorrow. Then on Thursday, he'll address a joint session of Congress, a first for any Pope. After that, he'll speak to the United Nations in New York. The third and final stop for his U.S. tour is Philadelphia, where he will celebrate Mass at the World Meeting of Families. Earlier today, an elaborate farewell ceremony was waiting for Pope Francis as he prepared to depart Cuba. He stood with President Raul Castro and said goodbye to local clergy and the Cuban people. This morning, Pope Francis celebrated Mass at a shrine in Santiago de Cuba, Cuba's second largest city. He urged the faithful to focus on the family and thanked Cubans for their hospitality. In true Pope Francis fashion, he chose to get personal with people, shaking hands and sharing hugs. That may be curtailed a bit in the U.S. This visit is considered a national security special event, meaning the Secret Service and FBI are coordinating one of the largest security operations ever. Reporting in Washington, I'm Chris Welch. Keeping our eye on the economy, China and the United States need to collaborate to expedite reforms and combat slowing growth in the world's second largest economy. Former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson said that on Tuesday. He said they have an economic model that has run out of steam and they need to place much more reliance on domestic-led growth, domestic consumption. Chinese President Jinping will tour the U.S. this week and he will meet with President Barack Obama. Here's our New York Stock Exchange with the Stock Market Watch. As you can see, everything down. The Dow down 179, NASDAQ 72, S&P 524. Coming up on News 2, do we need to be concerned about a tropical disturbance out there named Ida? Plus, Hispanic Heritage Month events are underway and due to the budget, some changes this year. Details coming up. Welcome back. Several St. Croix public schools are hosting open house events in the next two weeks. Education officials are urging parents to attend the events so they can get the chance to tour the school and speak with their child's teachers. On Wednesday, Alexander Henderson School is hosting a back-to-school affair starting at 5.30. Juanita Gardine has a back-to-school night Thursday. That starts at 5.30 in the school's auditorium. Next Wednesday, September 30th, Elena Christian Junior High is hosting their open house from 9 a.m. to noon. That same evening, Central High will host its parent back-to-school night at 5.30. Woodson Junior High's open house is Thursday, October 1st, and that begins at 5.30. Some of the presidential candidates have started to make the rounds in the U.S. territories to drum up support for their bid for the White House. This week, Republican Senator Ted Cruz's father visited schools in St. Thomas and St. Croix. On Tuesday, he stopped by St. Joseph's Catholic High School to chat with the juniors and seniors. News 2's Erica Parsons has that story. Sandy, I don't know if the students here at St. Joseph's felt just how significant this visit was from Senator Cruz's father, but he is an ordained minister, and two sticking points he shared with them, to remain true to their conservative values, and that yes, Christians do have a place in the political process. St. Joseph's Catholic High School was the first St. Croix stop for presidential hopeful Senator Ted Cruz's dad, Reverend Rafael Cruz. It is not really biblical to say, well, you know, separation of church and state. I don't want to be involved. Separation of church and state is not a concept that is either in the Constitution or in the Declaration. Cruz is in the territory at the invitation of local Republican Party State Chair John Canegada, and he's on the campaign trail drumming up support for his son. I must have told my son a dozen times, you know, Ted, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where are we going to go? Cruz spoke to the school's juniors and seniors, focusing on conservative values like the institution of marriage being between a man and a woman, the problem of abortion, and the role of Christians in politics. The Bible tells us the opposite. We should be salt and light in every area, whether it is the media, or arts and entertainment, or sports, or education, or business, or government. 
Reverend Cruz closed his message to students by urging them to learn the Bible to keep close to them and encouraging the 17-year-olds in the group to get involved in the political process. This was another example for our students to see from a political as well as a religious aspect how important it is to maintain your values as well as you become more of a civic uh, leader. Erica Parsons, News 2. The U.S. Departments of Education and Justice announced the completion of the English Learner Toolkit to support states, districts, and schools in meeting their legal obligations for ensuring access to quality education. The EL Toolkit is a companion to the English Learner Guidance released jointly by Education and Department of Justice in January 2015 and consists of 10 chapters, each chapter aligned to one of the 10 sections of the guidance. The toolkit is free and accessible to the public can be, and can be easily downloaded from the U.S. Department of Education's website. This year, the VI Puerto Rico Friendship Committee is heading the local Hispanic Heritage Celebration, and while they expect to have a full celebration, some areas have suffered, they say, because of the lack of funding. News News' Erica Parsons has details. We have some beautiful, young, uh, graceful, uh, intelligent young ladies. Miss Virgin Islands Puerto Rico Friendship won't be selected in the traditional way this year. We're going to have a committee to interview them, uh, what is the significance of the VI Puerto Rico, what it means to them. Uh, they have to relate their family to the function. And then we will have them wear a cultural wear, a simple cultural wear to demonstrate um, their, their traditions and culture, and then the committee will decide who will be the queen. It's just one of the areas that has seen cutbacks because of limited funding. This year, because of the lateness in starting the, the, um, the committee and because of the lack of funds, we will not have a big, fancy um, pageant. Organizers from the VIPR committee do rely on government funding to help host the Hispanic celebrations but those funds have been slow in coming. Committee officials are already looking at funding options for the next celebration, but for now, they're relying heavily on sponsors. We have sponsors like Banco Popular, Diageo, Crucian Rum, um, Tourism, Department of Tourism, and the Lottery of St. Croix. They are going to sponsor our cultural groups that are coming from Puerto Rico. And we have um, other sponsors that are coming in slowly, but we get in there because without the sponsors, we're not going to be able to have all of these because the government is short of money. So we try to come up with different sponsors. So I'd like to thank all of them. Erica Parsons, News 2. And be sure to count on two to keep you updated. Well, as we continue our hurricane season awareness, Vitima's director, Mona Barnes, reminds us about Securing objects as well as other hurricane preparedness tips. Here's more. Any other tips you can offer um, regarding preparing maybe even the home? You know, you're talking about when we rebuild since the prior hurricanes, mm -hmm. everybody kind of rebuilds stronger, yes. different structures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what other little tips we could talk about to prepare the home in particular? You know, we talk about airborne objects outside the home. Mm -hmm. if you have pools and, and yeah. stuff like well, that. Well, if you mm -hmm. have objects outside, the key is to bring them inside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your patio, furniture, and, and stuff. And if, if you don't have shutters, everybody can afford shutters. But if you can, it's a great investment. Uh, you can do it over time. But if you don't have shutters, then you have to be prepared to, to board the windows uh, of, of your home. So that would be some of the tips that I would have. Well, I want to say it's very important even to talk to people outside of the agency. I mean, coming here today, uh, I met one of the, I guess he's an employee of TV2, Phil, and, and he gave an, an excellent idea as far as refrigeration. Mm -hmm. And what he shared was uh, you can have three or four uh, gallon bottle, bottles. And what you can do is just, even now, just put water in it, put it in the freezer, and then if there is a significant event or if the power goes out, what you do is you take those gallon bottle, bottles, put them in your refrigerator, and it becomes a, a mechanism to keep your, your food still um, cool. So I never <laughs> thought about it before, and, and so I think that's a great tip as well. And again, if they want any information and even things that I have not covered, mm -hmm. they can go to the website. Again, www.vitima.gov. And 
Amanda, be sure to tune in for other tips throughout the hurricane season. Now, do we need to be concerned about Ida? Bernie has the latest. We'll be right back.